Welcome to another edition of What Barry's Talking About from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. On this week's program, low volume roads. What are they and are we taking proper care of them? Barry Mayor Alex Nuttall delves further into the city's homeless crisis. A couple of local organizations have brought back their home sweet home event to help raise funds for those needing access to food, clothing, and community support programs. Been a year since Barry teacher and early childhood educator Angela Odesanya brought us Amelia's loose part art book to spark the curiosity and imagination in children. She's ready to jumpstart them again with a sequel. And we get an update on the Barry Colts after weekend one of the OHL season. We get the conversation started after this. It was an adventure for kids, Amelia's loose part art book, to get their creative juices flowing away from electronic devices and TV. Author and educator Angela Odesanya has written a sequel, Amelia's loose part art, A Day at the Beach. Barry 360's MJ gets a preview. We talked about, was it a year ago? Yeah, the first book has been doing amazing. Uh, It's been well received by educators and parents, um, and it has now been started selling in the states as well and it was all about getting kids to explore the world around them i guess and 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 see how they can create art with with the things that they have yeah so loose parts is um a child development theory and it is the idea that children will use everything in their environment as a resource and i highlighted it as a resource that can be used in an artistic way so they follow amelia as she discovers Uh, this art form for the first time and models for children how to engage in this process so that by the end of the story that's what they want to go out and do. And I guess Amelia now, um, (laughs) she's got a sequel in the works. Yeah, so this this book, when I wrote Amelia's Loose Part Art, it was always meant to be a series um, because Loose Parts has so many, there's so many directions it can go. So we're going to watch Amelia build every, in every book her understanding of Loose Parts. So in this book that's coming out now, which is Amelia's Loose Part Art, A Day at the Beach, she's discovering a few things. One is that uh, loose Parts are more than just rocks and feathers and pine cones and those sort of things to include sensory items like sand and water and Play-Doh um, because those are also loose parts by definition. And so she learns that, and she's also learning that these loose parts can be used for more than just art. So now they are tools for her to solve problems that she encounters on her day at the beach. Okay, so can you give us like um, an example of a, of a problem that she comes across? Absolutely. So um, she finds a fish that's actually be- uh, beached on the on the beach, like in a puddle, is stuck, and she wants to get this fish back into the ocean. And so what she decides to do is to build it a water slide so that it can slide down. So she digs out the hole and she lines it with rocks and shells, and she uses her bucket to collect water, and that water acts as that loose part. Um, to help the fish swim down back to the ocean. This is, a, what age group is this best for, for, for kids when it comes to all the books? The book series is designed for kids age 3 to 8. Uh, that was always my intention, which is about preschool to grade 3. Um, but in my work over the past year, I've been doing a lot of workshops and school visits um, where I'm noticing that teachers are telling me they're using this in their grade 4, 5, 6, classrooms. I have had teachers as high as grade eight tell me that they are maybe not using the picture book as much, but they are going to be bringing the concepts to their older students, which is fantastic. Do you think um, maybe, and you don't have to answer this if you're not sure, just something that popped into my head, maybe it's useful for slightly older students. We did, of course, have the blip called a pandemic, and um, so maybe some kids are a little bit behind on, say, some of their problem solving, which is where Amelia's adventures could, could help be helpful. Yeah, so I think that um, in general, I, I think I would take that more to a general approach uh, to the way our society is now um, with the social media and the screen time and the organized sports and the hurriedness of our everyday lives. But parents are very frequently stepping in too soon, um, and teachers too. <laughs> we, as adults, we tend to step in too soon to assist 
uh, children and solving problems, older or younger. Um, and it could be to save time, to avoid a mess, um, to avoid frustration for the child or the parent. And we do it because we are in a rush. We don't have time to just let children um, take forever to learn and work through, through things, which is why it's so important that their play experiences has this embedded in it. So less screen time, more time outside, less toys that are used in one specific way, uh, more open-endedness in their play to counteract the, the problem-solving opportunities we take away in their daily routines. It's funny that you say that. Um, I, I have a regular argument with my daughter when we're leaving the car and she has her hands full of stuff and so do I. Um, and she's yeah. like, mom, help me with my stuff. I'm like, I have my hands full too. She's like, but this is hard. And I'm like, you are a strong, independent woman. You can do this. And then now she starts quoting that back to me all the time. Like if I want to do something for it, she's like, I'm a strong, independent woman. Like, yes. <laughs> That's amazing. And you know, those mantras that we give our children are really important, and that is something that Amelia does in the books, too. She has repetitive mantras that she's using. There was one in the first book, and now there's a new one in the second book, and it's basically um, the idea that, you know, the ideas to solve problems are inside of you, and the resources to make it happen are all around you. You just have to look for them. And so rather than always showing them the solution, let them get messy. Let them figure it out. Let them um, struggle. I think we need that because then when they're older and there's real big problems in life, they won't have the resilience or the, the, um, upper, the, the skills they need to problem solve through that and work through that on their own. Now, you've got a Kickstarter campaign now. Is, um, is the second book, is it available now or you've got a Kickstarter campaign happening right now? Yeah, it's a Kickstarter to pre-order. Um, it is a way for the community to step in and say, yes, I support this cause, I want a copy of this book when it's released, or I want to gift it to my child's teacher or school, or I want to donate it. I have options, like if you don't have children and you just want to donate a book, it's there. And um, the book itself will be released in March uh, 2025. How can people uh, contribute to your project? <laughs> If they go to uh, ameliasbooks.com, that will take you to my Kickstarter page, and there's a whole bunch of information there, and there are a bunch of reward tiers that range from $15 to $1,000, um, because sometimes bigger organizations want to uh, have lots of books for their causes. Um, so there's a tier for everybody, and all you do is back it between now and October 24th. No easy fixes to the homeless crisis, several directions to go, all needing cooperation from all levels of government. Barry Mayor Alex Nuttall joins Barry 360's Ian McLennan with an update on the situation in Barry, in particular at Bursey Park. How long has that Bursey Park encampment been, been, been there, or, you know, its growth, I guess? Uh, what we saw this year was uh, Bursey Park be uh, turned into a place where tents were being erected and folks were uh, living there, um, and I and I'm guessing it was May or June, uh, where when it started originally and uh, and then grew grew through the summer. Uh, so yeah, I mean it is a bit of a divisive issue, but at the same time, I think that uh, you know our community as a whole uh, is saying that we need our parks to be safe. We need to ensure that these uh, spaces are are welcoming for for children and families, and uh, that's what they're designed for. And certainly when you consider the proximity to uh, schools uh, for Bursey Park and some others, it's important that we uh, get this right and make sure that, uh, that they are maintained as very safe places. What prompted the, the decision to ask, if they would, the, the residents of uh, the encampment to leave? What was the trigger? Well, I think, number one, the county of Simcoe is in the lead in terms of being able to find the right shelter spaces and the appropriate type of uh, places for folks to stay because in different scenarios, uh, different uh, support services are required. And so, you know, we're falling in behind uh, the county of Simcoe in this and certainly support what they're doing. For the city's perspective, I mean, we have a return to school. Uh, we have an encampment down the street from that school. We have a, a park that kids walk through to get to the school being turned into a into an encampment. And obviously all of those uh, things coming together 
But I think overall, uh, like for me, as I look at this around the city, mayors are at a point because communities are at a point where uh, the encampments, you know, can't just be left uh, untouched, uh, specifically those ones that are in uh, proximity to schools or daycares or those types of services. So, um, you know, I think that you'll see more and more action on on this file. Uh, that means we need more and more spaces for individuals who are experiencing homelessness. We need more and more health supports uh, when it comes to mental health and addiction support. But it also means that uh, you're going to see, I think, a, a higher standard in terms of expectation when it comes to safety in, in, in parks. You mentioned the County of Simcoe for people who aren't clear. The County of Simcoe oversees social services, the shelter system, in the county, but also including Barry and Aurelia, correct? Yeah, the City of Barry Act outlined that they uh, have to be the the uh, manager, uh, local service manager for the social services. So uh, until you know such a day that that were to change, uh, we as the City of Barry just don't have control over the subject. It's the County of Simcoe. Uh, we collect your taxes as the City of Barry, and then we receive an invoice from the County of Simcoe, and and they manage all of the funding and the supports uh, in that system. What order, though, did it come from, the city or the county, to remove the encampment residents? What? So when it comes to the actual uh, trespassing notices and uh, then a, a eventual uh, eviction, if that's what it comes to, that's from city bylaw and police. Um, the actual services that are being offered that need to be offered in advance of that are from the county of Simcoe. And so really it's a, a service-led initiative because if you don't have those services available uh, right now, the courts have said you can't remove the encampments. And how many beds did the County of Simcoe open to provide shelter space for those that were in the, are in the encampment? Well, I think they had enough uh, spaces for each of the individuals there. I think that was between 20 and 30 individuals just going on memory here. Uh, could have been a couple less, could have been a couple more. Uh, so, you know, that that's what they would have had to have available in one uh, type or another. And some people ask, well, why didn't they just do this in February or or in or in May, June? Why why wait until the summer moved along? If they, if they if they were there, why well, not over them? That's exactly why, because we didn't have those shelter spaces available, so the county of Simcoe couldn't go in uh, and provide the services, and therefore the city of Barrie couldn't go in and provide the trespassing. So once we have the opening, uh, it was uh, it was actioned on. The offers of help and support were given, um, but certainly. Uh, we need to have more transitional housing. We need to have more uh, shelter space available. We also need to make sure that we have those mental health and uh, rehabilitative supports in place uh, to help individuals who are struggling with addictions or severe mental health issues. And, um, you know, I think through what we saw from the province in terms of the hard funding, uh, I think that'll be a, a big help going forward, but uh, not until that funding uh, reaches the ground. So what are those encampment residents supposed to do in the interim until they, you know, if they do need addiction supports or, or what have you? I know it's not, you're yeah. not the uh, overseer well, yeah, of Yeah, CMHA that, is, is available, right? Um, and so, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, a referral within these services to help get the right uh, support workers uh, around individuals who are experiencing homelessness. And, um, you know, we're, we're really relying on that relationship and those referrals from uh, our social services and, and, and from the county to the necessary supports. And Mary, um, going back to January, I think it was January 2023, there was a court ruling uh, in Kitchener-Waterloo that, you know, the encampments were okay, that the people had a right to be there if they did not have the proper housing, the, spot, the proper shelter space, and, and that their needs were being met. Some had, may have had disabilities or, or mental health issues or what have you. Did the city get legal advice before bylaw officers went in? And, and do you believe the city is doing this legally? Yeah, well, the answer is yes. Um, I'm not going to comment on the specific legal advice because that's actually, you know, between um, members of council, myself and, and uh, uh, our, our, our legal department. But I will say this, that um, the current situation cannot continue. We need to have the ability for municipalities to ensure these spaces, these parks um, are safe and uh, they're free of drug paraphernalia and they're free of weapons. And we know that there's been quite a number of occasions where those weapons have been found inside of these encampments. But we also need them not to be there for the individuals who are experiencing this homelessness. You know, we've seen 
multiple fires inside of encampments. We've seen an individual unfortunately pass away due to one of those. And so we really do need to find a way uh, to get to the other side of this. The interesting piece for, I think, municipalities at this point is because of the court rulings, it makes it really, really, really difficult. And, you know, I think it's important that we call on the provincial and federal governments to find legislation, to write legislation that's going to allow us as municipalities to uh, provide that safety. And you'll see that happening over the next number of weeks. The, you know, I'm not acting uh, as the mayor of Barrie in a, you know, singular, isolated way. I think you're going to see many mayors say, we need to find a better way forward. This isn't working. Province feds take intervener status on our uh, court cases when they come. Uh, feds province get legislation in place that makes sense to help these individuals, but also to keep our, our city safe and clean. And uh, finally, uh, if the requirement is to use Section 33, to use a notwithstanding uh, clause to get that legislation through and done, uh, then they're going to have to do that. Because at this point, what the courts have done is that they've legislated the city's bylaws out of existence. And so the things that we would expect as local citizens. Is it powerless? Uh, close to. Yeah. Yeah, close to. I mean, uh, sp- specifically in the city of Barrie's perspective and in, 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 in our situation, we're not responsible for social services. We're not responsible for shelter space. We're not responsible for transitional housing. But we are responsible to enforce the bylaws of the city. We then have to rely on somebody else to do all of these things in advance, being the county of Simcoe. Before we can move in and do anything on our side in terms of enforcement of our bylaws and parks. And so it, it has left us, I wouldn't say powerless, but uh, it is a very uphill climb. And the amount of time that it takes to coordinate uh, with those other levels of government, whether it's county or province, so that the city can enforce its bylaws, uh, it's, it's just too long. It's just too long. You know, if you speak to the residents, Uh, who are directly impacted, you know, folks who've experienced some really difficult things, right? And I'm not going to get into the most, you know, difficult ones, but you can imagine there'd be some difficult things. I think that for them, it's been way, 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 way too long. And, and I understand that. And I respect that. What, what we need to fix that in the future is a new legislative approach and, only the province and the federal government can deal with that. And you asked me a question about legal, you know, uh, I believe that there is a very high probability that this entire question will be determined in the Supreme Court of Canada. What we're seeing right now is an alignment in communities across Canada. And then we're seeing an alignment by representatives who are elected officials in those communities we need to find the alignment on the provincial level and eventually uh, the federal level. And through all of that, the courts, you know, will determine who's done it right, who's done it wrong and how we can improve going forward. But it requires legislation from the province and the feds. Now, obviously the situation homelessness is so, is so complex, but, um, and cities are trying to manage and come up with their own solutions and what works best. There are other encampments in Barrie. Not all are in parks. Are they next or is it specifically Bursey because it is in a park? Well, look, I, I, I think uh, for me, I see a situation eventually where we don't have encampments. Uh, those aren't overnight changes. Those are, you know, this is what, 10 years in the making as we discussed at the start of this. It doesn't get fixed in a day. There has to be the proper support services available. There has to be the investment in these frontline services like the heart hubs. Uh, that needs to get into place. We need to make sure that there's better investment in detox so that when somebody is ready to make that move towards getting sober, that uh, the service is available for them to be able to do so. So there's a lot of work that has to be done prior to being able to do as you're you're asking. Uh, But if you're asking me, do I, is is it a vision or a dream that we have a city that doesn't have encampments? Yes. Just like it's a it's a vision and a dream that we have a city that has the right support services in place so that we don't have to be in this situation. 
This is what Barry's talking about from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. If you are in need of help, our two guests today are probably the most helpful people in the world. Nikki Glenn from Barry Families Unite and Coach Amber McCauley. R&R, Programs for Restoring Relationships. That's what I'm working on right now. It's a combination of restorative justice, mindfulness, emotional intelligence, and pairing with Barry Families Unite enables us to have a wraparound service that includes food, clothing, household essentials. So it's a very exciting partnership and we're thrilled to be here to talk with you. So you have a big event coming up on October 17th, Home Sweet Home. Give us the lowdown, what's happening and why? Well, we are gathering our community together on October 17th at the Traditions Banquet Hall on John Street. And we are bringing forth to our community a wide platform of wonderful services um, related to the home. Contractors, de- decor, we even have a live painter showing up to uh, be painting during the event and then we'll be auctioning off her painting at the end. And all these live auction items, silent auction items, all the funds are going towards uh, our collaborative programming. And what is involved in that programming? What are you, what are you offering to everybody through the money you're going to raise here? We are offering absolutely free services, um, very low barriers to access. Anyone um, 16 and over um, can give us a shout. Uh, They can contact either Barry Families Unite or myself through um, various outlets. And they can partake in a five-week group program. Um, The programs are being offered at Georgian College. And uh, they also then sign up to get good food boxes. um, And they also have access to volunteer opportunities. um, You know, if I could talk about the roots of what we do, it's really about supporting people to have a sense of belonging. And this has been expressed in our community as a concern, especially families who are um, less resourced, living um, with challenges, meeting financial needs. Um, And so, yeah, Nikki and I have linked arms to kind of connect with anybody and everybody who needs some support in connecting with a broad community. I'm guessing people are knocking your door down looking for help because that's kind of the state we're in right now, having come out of the pandemic, having come through the economic situation we have. It's starting to get better, but it's going to take a while for people to recover from all of that. Exactly, yeah. Um, From our standpoint, I I would just like to add that um, Barry Families Unite and what we've been doing and continue to do with providing dignified access to essential needs to anyone in our community in the low-income brackets. Um, Aligning with what Amber is doing for us just felt like a natural progression in terms of providing our clients with that ability to um, hopefully get themselves to another level and, and help themselves grow. Um, so yeah, we're very excited about this pilot project that we're working on. How did you see things escalate during the pandemic and how have things changed since then or have they? Um, yeah, so starting a Facebook group at the beginning of the pandemic, I could not have envisioned us being where we are now. It, uh, it really wasn't in my mind frame at that point in time. It truly has been an ongoing uh, evolution of trying to find the niche where the needs are in our community. We have a lot of amazing agencies that provide a lot of fantastic resources. Um, so I'm not a believer of duplicating services. Uh, it just provides, or it means that your people are are um, paying double overheads for all these different things. So it's very important for me that our agency find the targeted areas where there were gaps missing. So um, that's kind of what we set out to do, and that has provided us with the, the framework from which we've grown. So we now we're into our fourth season as a registered not-for-profit, doing exactly that, um, filling the gaps with grocery assistance, helping gap people between their food bank orders, um, year-round a seasonal access to uh, access to seasonal clothing, and um, start over kits of a variety of different kinds. So people who've had to kind of restart their lives and need all those linens and housewares and such. Have you seen people come and go, and but then? More- more people come on board? Yeah, we have. Yeah, and that's that's very encouraging to uh, kind of see the tail end of people as uh, they needed that service for, uh, you know, a chunk of time, but have uh, found themselves in a different situation now and are able to move on. 
Um, but that being said, we are also probably the busiest we've ever been in the three and a half years since we incorporated as a not-for-profit. Um, a huge increase in newcomers to our community, um, a lot of increase in uh, single parents who are maybe actually working a full-time job, but at a low income full-time job. And the math just doesn't work right now when you start looking at the cost of rent and food and everything else. Um, yeah. And, and based on what I've seen uh, in interactions on, on uh, the Facebook page, you have a lot of people who are coming to the rescue, who want to chip in, who want to help out yeah, yeah, we've been very fortunate, and a lot of that, I believe, was a result of um, the timing of our birth, I guess, for lack of a better explanation. We were just at the right place at the right time, and um, we have uh, 23,000 plus uh, individuals uh, following along on our Facebook group, which um, we've changed the Facebook group a lot. It is no longer what it used to be but we're maintaining it as a space for us to be able to reach out and connect with our community because it is definitely a curated list of people within our community. Yeah, things are evolving and you've evolved as well. Yeah. Yeah. Amber, tell us more about R&R programs for restoring relationships. How did that get started? Well, uh, like Nikki and BFU, um, it certainly began as a response to uh, the effects of the pandemic. So it's it's very well known that the pandemic created a lot of divisions in people, a lot of shame, a lot of blame, a lot of struggles relating to mental health, addictions, um, discrimination, things like just some issues in the community have really imploded since. And the r and programs for restoring relationships are a way of people to come together uh, to learn about navigating conflict, how to nurture healthy relationships um, in the workplace, in the family, and in the community. And and uh, so it's it's a it's a blend of a few ingredients: restorative justice, mindfulness, and emotional intelligence. And what Nikki and I have talked about is, without healthy relationships, it's really difficult to thrive. So if we're struggling in our relationships at work, in the community, um, even in our neighbors, um, there's really this sense of disconnection. And th that lack of belonging has serious effects on people's health, mentally and physically. And same with um, without food, without proper nutrition and a, a house and that sort of thing, it's it's hard to, to thrive. So pairing these two services together, relationships, physical, mental well-being, uh, we really think that we have a unique initiative and the Home Sweet Home event is a way for us to really spread the word because as much as you might think that people are banging our doors down, um, there's also a lot of people who don't know about our services and it's absolutely free. Um, we, we have resources. We really want to serve the community and um, connect them. So We are hoping to raise $20,000 at the Home Sweet home event what's going to happen with that money well it will enable us to support hun like hundreds of people it's not a calculated um, way that we can say you know how many exact people because some people may need a good food box but they don't necessarily need the household essentials or some people may need a one-to-one -one session um, with myself and my team but they don't necessarily need access to the five-week program uh, but we can say that twenty thousand dollars is going to touch uh, hundreds of people in Simcoe County. Sixty dollars a ticket to, to get involved and then there's a silent auction as well what kinds of items are people going to be bidding on? Well we're pleased to announce we've got quite a wide variety. We have electrical contractors, we have general contractors, we have um, home decor items. All kinds of services that people may be in need of and, and uh, are hoping to, uh, to get some help with paying for those services, they could actually bid and, and maybe get themselves a deal. Exactly. Exactly. And even if people don't necessarily need the services, 
um, there are some items that can be uh, bid on and paid forward. So if you don't necessarily need um, one of these services, but you want to come to the event and support, uh, you can pay it forward. So there's a carpenter in particular who said, you know, I'd be happy if someone bid on my services and I could go to a home of someone who doesn't necessarily have the funds for a carpenter and help them out for a day. So it's a really pay it forward element as well. Uh, we think there's a spot for everyone and we want to fill the house. Mm-hmm. So you're looking for people with big hearts. Big, big hearts. hearts. Where can people get tickets? Um, people can um, follow us on our Facebook or Instagram handle, which is Home Sweet Home Simcoe County. And both those platforms right at the top of the homepage of each will uh, take you to our ticket platform. All right. And again, it is October 17th. Where and what time? Traditions Banquet Hall in Barrie on John Street. And doors open at 6. The show starts at 6.30 and we wrap up by 9. What Barry's talking about is a weekly podcast featuring the best Barry and Simcoe County have to offer and more. You can get caught up and make it easy to keep up in the future by subscribing to What Barry's Talking About through any podcast distributor. Still to come on What Barry's Talking About, how'd the Barry Colts look in the first two games of the OHL season? And we learn about low-volume roads and how to take care of them. Now this. Our community rocks. It's a well-known fact blood transfusion saves lives. It's also a well-known fact that the world relies on voluntary unpaid donations to fill the need for blood. The need for blood never ends. Canadian Blood Services in Barrie is calling on you to help save a life. Please consider donating today. Appointments are mandatory and must be booked in advance. Book today at blood.ca through the Give Blood app or by calling 1-888-2-DONATE. Barry's Rock Station, Rock 95. This is what Barry's talking about from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. Special workshop coming up in Barry on low volume roads, roads less traveled but that do require some attention when it comes to maintenance and such. Our Ian McLennan learns more from James Smith, manager of technical programs and research at Good Roads. I guess for the public, what is a low volume road? There's many definitions. Um, One of the more common ones would be seeing under 400 vehicles per day. However, in Ontario, low volume could even mean something smaller than that, where typically the majority of them will see less than 200 vehicles per day. At a volume like that, they're usually either gravel or surface treated, and kind of rare occasions they might actually be paved with asphalt. So in, uh, say, example, Simcoe County, whether it's Barrie, Aurelia, or the, the rural areas, we, we, we see them across the region, though? We drive on them? Absolutely. Um, one of the reasons kind of really coming to Barrie was the fact that Simcoe County as a whole, the lower tiers within it, are a great example and cross-section of low-volume roads across the province. And we see them um, municipalities with small uh, populations, but also have a expansive road network, and there's that kind of discontinuity, or like really the ability to pay and maintain these roads. Um, so we're looking to come and try to help people better look after those roads. Yeah, it said in the release, it's time to take control of your road maintenance challenges. So, what sort of challenges um, would um, you know frontline workers face that they that could be different from those that are high volume roads? I guess what we see when we're we're thinking gravel, so the first off, it's trying to keep that gravel on the road. Um, What we'll see um, in an attempt sometimes to save money, a municipality will go out, they'll put fresh gravel on their roads, but it's really not thick enough uh, to stay on the road, and we see it ending up in the ditch. Alternatively, it could also be due to actually the type of material that's going on there. It's not the same same kind of aggregate you want in your base and sub-base of a paved road, there are specific gravel or types of gravel that work best for those roads. Um, So it's kind of identifying or realizing those and what's going to work best in your situation. Municipality may not have uh, the most optimal gravel uh, out there to sort of keep it on the road, but then there's also tools and techniques in terms of stabilization, and we can categorize that material and look for ways to improve um, the way that road will, will function. And so we're trying to capture that. 
We also see um, municipalities sometimes struggling with the way they maintain uh, these low bell volume roads through the winter. Uh, what we do is going to be very impactful into how that road performs in the summer and vice versa. So by passing along knowledge, we hopefully will get to see those roads better maintained, which is going to serve everybody in those communities. Are, are there certain standards that have to be followed, or could you touch on different types of gravel? So it, it, it depends on location of the, you know, of, of, of the road itself. I'm just wondering if there isn't something that some sort of rule book or guideline book that uh, Frontline would uh, follow. So there, there are best practices out there, and there's also we have the Ontario Provincial Standards uh, that give you uh, sort of guidance on what um, what you can do in certain situations or what your specific material, the characteristics should be. Uh, but like anything, those are kind of guidance. There's nothing specifically that says thou shall, and municipalities based upon their situation, sometimes do things do things differently or go beyond and have uh, some great performing roads. So we all talk about efficiencies and, uh, you know, cost effective and, you know, money's tight. Are there, is there, te- are there technologies out there that um, work well, but also um, work well in terms of the bottom line? We're, we're starting to see more of that now. Um, a couple of the, the keynote speakers who are coming from the, the U.S., um, have developed kind of tools uh, to do that in terms of ensuring that the right material is going on the road or how to enhance, again, how to enhance that material. Um, We also have another keynote speaker who has uh, really thought outside of the box when it comes to his small municipality where they've taken an innovative approach to the way that they do bridges. One of the things that he's become quite known for across the U.S. is taking uh, flat uh, railroad cars and turning those into the essentially the the bridge deck for their very low volume roads in their county. So if I'm driving on a gravel road, for example, I mean, uh, quite often in the summer, it's always dusty if we don't get a lot of rain. It can be quite bumpy. I don't know if they, if uh, gravel roads qualify, you know, getting potholes. But next time I go out on a gravel road, I, I can suggest that maybe things could be maintained better or, you know, or as I just assume dust was part of gravel road traveling. No, it's not. Um, that's uh, another area. Uh, there are... There's a specific tool that was developed at the University of California at Davis through their pavement center that looks at recommending what type of additive you can apply to that roadway to, I guess, eliminate the dust. If we also apply kind of the right amount and the right gradation will also significantly impact and lessen the amount of dust that we see on that road. So, no, it's, it's definitely not something that we need to live with. So there's a, there's a real science to, to maintaining these roads uh, and, and, and the upkeep. Absolutely. It's probably best described kind of half science, half art. It's kind of a marriage of, of those two. What, what works well in one place might be suboptimal somewhere else. So it's trying to find that balance. And our goal is to give, give the municipalities that are attending the tools, techniques, and ideas that they can look at trying and help uh, yeah, reduce the amount of money that they, they spend on their gravel roads. The OHL season underway, promising to be a good one for the Barry Colts, who played their first two games last weekend. Barry 360's Will Conkin looks back with Colts writer and broadcaster Gene Pereira. Colts are uh, one and one on the season to start, beat the Sudbury Wolves 3-1, then fell to the North Bay Battalion 4-1 at the uh, Colts home opener. Um, After that one, uh, head coach Marty Williamson said the Colts were playing pond hockey, not enough structure. Uh, Gene, is that a good summary of how it looked to you? Yeah, I mean, obviously, in both these games, uh, Barry started slow, but... uh... You know, again, there was a lot of structure uh, to the game on on Saturday night against North Bay. And, you know, against a team like that, they're going to make you pay. I mean, they're well coached by Ryan Lillian. And, and, uh, you know, Barry just couldn't seem to get in the flow. They got stronger as the game went along, and they got themselves back in it. And it was even, but... uh, you know, again, uh, they, they needed more structure to the game, and uh, they, they just weren't doing it early on. They were kind of just all over the place, and, 
you know, a lot of defensemen rushing and that type of thing out of position, and the uh, it ended up costing them on the winning goal. What else kind of stood out from these uh, first two games? And uh, also, you were telling me off air that uh, Riley Patterson is out. Yeah, Riley Patterson on Saturday night got a slew foot early on. Uh, the league reviewed it, and he gets a two-game suspension. Uh, unfortunately for Barry, uh, on Friday night, two Sudbury players got uh, slew foots and got tossed from the game, but neither of them get suspensions, but the Barry Colt Riley Patterson does. So obviously one of their top scorers, and they're going to be without him for uh, for two games. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you, early on, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's going to take time. I already talked about, you know, the Lions players getting used to one another, and I think that's what we saw early on. But, uh, Keyshawn Aitchison as well really stood out. I mean, uh, he's ready to have a big year, and uh, you know he's always brought that physical element. But now we're starting to see him jump into the rush more. He scored a power play goal in uh, Friday's win, and then he scored another power play goal on Saturday. And uh, you know I think that part of his game is really going to step up, and he's going to be a force, a guy that many expect to go in the first top ten picks in the NHL draft this year. And we have a new face on the roster. The Colts acquired Ottawa Senators prospect Gabriel Ellison uh, from the Niagara Ice Dogs in exchange for two draft selections, I believe. He's around uh, six foot six, six foot seven, and uh, two hundred and sixteen pounds. Uh, the defenseman brings uh, size to the back line. He seems like uh, what Barry was looking for. They were looking for a player like this. Yeah, he gives you that kind of imposing defenseman back there. He he really plays with a physical edge. He's not a, afraid to get involved physically and. You know, he's one of those guys that makes forwards kind of take notice and, and look up because he's always going to be in your face. And, uh, um, you know, there's a little bit of rawness to his game. It's going to take a little bit of time, some development. There's a second-round pick of the Ottawa Senators, but you can see the skill there. But I think he's going to learn. Uh, he's going to have to learn a bit just, you know, as well, too, just, you know, when to kind of apply that, you know, physical edge and, kind of stay within the line, got a few penalties his first couple of games, but there's no doubt you see the impact that he can have back there. The Colts were missing uh, Bo Akey and uh, Cole Bodwin, but uh, you were telling me off air as well that uh, they're coming back. Yeah, great news. Cole Bodwin uh, came back on Monday from Utah camp, had an outstanding camp there. I mean, no surprise. Uh, you know, it's a huge addition, uh, one of their leaders and uh, their, their number one centerman. And, you know, again, he's just uh, one of those guys with great work ethic, and uh, he's a big addition to their offense. And as well, Bo Akey, I mean, it's going to be nice to see him. He's been cleared to play. Uh, he's coming back, uh, from what I understand, he's flying in from Edmonton today. So both of them will be in the lineup on Thursday. And for Bo, uh, he's been out for quite a bit, missed most of last season with shoulder surgery. So it'll be fun seeing him back in the lineup. And, you know, again, he's one of the top defense in the entire hockey league. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I, he'll have a big impact when he returns back there. We're off and running there, Gene. Till next time. Thanks. And that's our program for this week. Thanks to Ian, MJ, and Will for their input, to Matt Ladder for his technical expertise, and to you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to what Barry's talking about, rate it, review it. You can also keep up with what Barry's talking about on X at Barry360, on our website, barry360.com, and there's our daily Kickstart podcast available from any streaming service and on our website. I'm Dan Blakely. Hope you'll join us again next week.